Hello, everyone. I am Cody. And I'm Brent. And we are the Hugo Knots. And we are rolling out the red carpet here at Worldcon 2022 for interviews with authors and content creators. Hey, everybody. We are here for a very exciting interview with Rika Aoki. Hi author and Hugo finalist this year at Worldcon 2022 of Light from Uncommon Stars. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us, oh, Rika. Thank you very much, Cody. I'm really happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Um, we're super excited, as I already said, to interview you. And mm -hmm. so I have a lot of questions for you. But first yes. of all, we start with like a little kitschy red carpet question okay. since we're out here on the red carpet, uh -huh. which is uh, this year, uh -huh. what sci-fi author would you most like to go to dinner with? Hmm. Actually, I was just on a panel with David Gerald, and I totally fangirled over him. And he was saying such interesting things about science fiction and the queer community. And he's an elder in our community. And I was so intimidated by him, but he turned out to be like the nicest guy. And uh, so I would just go there and just listen and listen to him talk about how uh, people like me, queer people, have been in science fiction all along. Fascinating guy. Did, just really didn't expect him to be so approachable. I kind of expected, but I got high. <laughs> well, there's a, there is an element of uh, celebrity here. We're noticing it's our it's our first con uh -huh. um, where you come and you meet people such as yourself mm -hmm. when we met you yesterday, um, and you're thinking, oh, it's like I'm meeting a celebrity, and everyone's so nice and inviting and warm. And have you had the same experience? Is it your is it your first this con? This is my or is first it your, con. It's yeah. Like, here's okay, like that's my what little, I thought. Yeah. My first world con. And, um, you know, growing up, being in, in fandom and also um, being part of your uh, college science fiction club, Worldcon was always that Valhalla of things that people did who were in the know. But coming here and meeting people, it's really family, isn't it? It's a, you know, queer folk are all about chosen family, but this is a whole other family we chose. And um, I've been... You know, there have been a couple of times I've almost teared up because everyone's been so kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super warm. We've had the exact same experience and loved it so mm -hmm. far. Um, so speaking of, uh, what what does it feel like? You know, you've been you've been an author for a while. Mm -hmm. um, you have other books out, um, and this is your f your first would would you say kind of breakthrough novel, I breakthrough would call work? That, yes. mm -hmm. um, and what is that? What does that feel like? What's the, we saw the line for um, autographs is huge was it? for I, you. I, didn't, and, I just kept signing. Oh, it was and, big. Oh, yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. I like that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, okay. What does it feel like? It, okay, all my life, I've been wanting to be a writer. There, um, people process the world in different ways. Dancers dance, uh, you know, mathematicians mathematize. I, I write, and um, I love other things. I really love music. But writing is what I kind of feel that I was uh, put here to do. But wanting to write and dreaming about it is different from actually being recognized for it. And I spent years with small presses dreaming of this. Uh, and so I'll tell everyone who's there, it, it feels just as good as you thought it would. I, I can look now at my work with this breakthrough, thanks for calling it that. I'm so, yeah, so sweet. Uh, but looking at it, it feels like this has all been worth it. So, for, you know, for writers out there, don't give up because it's really sweet. The ice cream tastes better. The rain smells better. Even toast is better. And I'm not even that great on toast. <laughs> well, sounds like it's everything you it's, ever dreamed it's of. It's everything I ever dreamed of. And I get to meet great people like you. Oh, thank you. And well, we Brent, get to meet up there. great people like you. That's why we like doing the podcast. Thank you. Um, Okay. So, uh, with with that said, I'll transition into uh, Light from Uncommon Stars course, a bit sure. uh, with a first question that I was interested in. Um, I'm a musician as well, and I see that you're a composer, mm -hmm. listed as a composer on some things, uh -huh. and obviously there's a ton of um, really in-depth exploration of the competitive classical violinist community uh -huh. and Light from Uncommon Stars, which really fascinated me. I loved all that detail and the detail of... Um, you know, the repair shop and it, just really getting in on that. Um, what's, what is your experience with music and what, what made you, what did you bring into the book? Mm -hmm. Well, from 
Cody was talking about was I am a composer, and but the funny thing is I'm also trans, and a lot of the work that I had originally done was back in my pre-transition life. So some of that I'm trying to figure out how to bring it in. Um, you know, when I was in church, I composed an entire church musical. Uh, when I do spoken word poetry, you, you, you can find some of my spoken word backing tracks. I found tracks some yesterday on, on Spotify. Spotify. Yeah. Yes. And that's all me doing my own backing tracks. A little messy because I don't have a great, en well, I'm the engineer, and so I don't have a great engineer. And uh, But music has been, well, being able to write comes from, for me, one reservoir, and my creative energy is another reservoir. Sometimes I run out of words before I run out of creative energy. So I'm too tired to write poetry, but I still see the world and I want to work with it and, and create in it. And that's where the piano comes in. I'm primarily a pianist. I had to teach myself violin to write I this I saw book. that you were, yeah, you, you've just been learning violin. Uh -huh. yeah. It's amazing. Violin is just spectacular. I mean, just... Uh, I was, again, intimidated by it, but once I started picking it up and playing with it, it became a very intuitive instrument. You have to practice to get every your muscle memory right, but once you do that, it's a very kind and very uh, very, for, very intuitive instrument to play. Interesting. I'll have to try someday. I'm I not hope. a violinist either. You know, it's going to... What's, what's your main instrument? Oh, I, uh, mainly I sing, but oh, um, I do a lot of production and um, guitar and bass mm -hmm. and stuff. Well... For trans people, uh, if you notice here, I'm using, as a trans woman, we have to worry about the pitch of our voice. And so I'm only using the top register right now. So I always feel when I'm speaking with people, I have one hand tied behind my back. I can't use my full range. But when I can play something like the violin, oh, now we're off to the races. Me and Maria Callas, we have an even playing field and we're good. And so that's why I wanted to bring it in. It was a metaphor for finding your voice. And that's uh, that's pretty um, implicit in the novel as well. I'm glad. Um, you talked about yeah, you talk about the range and the the, the voice, the human voice um, of Katrina, and mm -hmm. um, finding the range through the instrument, mm -hmm. um, and finding the the confidence in your instrument for the first time that no matter what, it's going to pass. Yeah, not like letting letting the guard down. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you can you can feel it in the pages. Mm, thank um, you. So we think you succeeded. Um, <sighs> we're going to ask a little bit about um, the geography as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously the book takes place um, largely in the San Gabriel Valley yes. um, in L.A. Um, can you tell us why this is a special place for you? Why you decided to set it there? Do you have personal experience there? Well, What's I your... grew up in the San Gabriel Valley, right. okay, and so. I went to school there. Uh, I saw a lot of people working and having wonderful lives that were sometimes just terrible, but wonderful, you know, just human things. And I wanted to keep these people in my head no matter where I went. So when I went off to school, uh, when I went to Hawaii, when I went oh, just everywhere, I remembered where I came from. And so when I had the time to write a book, I realized with Tor and I realized with my next novel, uh, I was going to try to level up. I was going to try to get into a bigger pool. So I, I fell back into writing, okay, what did you always want to write? Who did you always want to write about? And I wanted to write about the donut shop on the corner. And I wanted to, you know, and there might be a spaceship under there. And I wanted to write about families that I grew up with. I went to San Gabriel High School. I, I wanted to do that. But also, um, when I had grown up, I had been, uh, you know, growing up as a child, your queer identity is not completely uh, realized yet. You go away to be queer and then you come back. So I wanted to bring the queerness with me and create a San Gabriel Valley that if maybe we'll still have our misadventures, we can all be welcome in. And do you feel like it was kind of like a, a coming home experience for you writing the writing the book like maybe I'm maybe you're more confident and older and you're like now you know we can come back and re-experience it through the I felt I, at the very beginning when I wrote it I feel I took advantage of it I just think I know this boom 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 when uh, when I felt uh, the novel coming together and when the cover came out and the book was in my hand I went around just saying thank you to the various places because uh, there is so much, and you know, everybody has their San Gabriel Valley, their own hometown, their own place. That's magical if only people knew about it. 
and uh, it took it took me a while to understand the magic of where I grew up. And so afterwards, I literally did go to the places that I was referring to and just stop and say thank you very much. That's that's awesome. Oh, that's it felt so good. It's a really whole wholesome experience. <laughs> well, you know, enough of my life's not wholesome. I have to have the wholesome to balance it out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, wholesome emotionally. Uh, Brent, I want to I want to invite you in to ask a question um, because this is your favorite question that you wrote about. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the donut shops. The donut shops. Mm -hmm. Hey. Um, Lean on in. Right. Um, so, uh, living in LA, there Lean are donut on in, shops. Because you are tall. <laughs> no, there are donut shops everywhere in LA, and uh -huh. there's such an interesting story. Mm -hmm. Why? And you kind of are like pointing to that through, you know, one of the main characters in the book is this um, uh, uh, refugee from an interstellar war who comes uh -huh. to the San Gabriel Valley to open uh -huh. a, a donut shop. And of course, that was uh, immediately, it was like, oh my gosh, I can see what she's doing there. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about why you made that choice and, and sort of the, the deal with the donut shops. No sure. Way. It's easy to say, I like donuts, which is true. But so much, a, a lot of what I want to do as a writer is show how the everyday things in life actually have far deeper significance. So you see a donut shop and you think, oh, there's a person from Cambodia, you know, selling donuts. What you don't understand or what people might, shouldn't say, I can't presume, what might sometimes be overlooked is that this person is a refugee. They are. They worked hard. They they are owning a donut shop because somebody in their family did. It's a shop that it's a retail shop that they can own that doesn't require much English because you can just point. There's a glass uh, glass case. So this is the way a lot of uh, immigrants were able to negotiate American culture for the first time. And yet the rest of us know it as a crawler. And I wanted to show you how, you know, we all participate in each other's stories. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and for those who aren't familiar, can you um, just tell us a little bit about, like, the, the uh, if you're familiar, sort of, um, uh, what was happening in Cambodia that sort of, like, led this to, well, to, to happen? What, usually, what ca Cambodia and Vietnam and in that area, it was ravaged, basically, at first by the Vietnam War. Pol Pot and his friends, you know. Yep. Bad day. So, um, they... They came over, and I remember when they first came over into the San Gabriel Valley. Oh, really? Valley. Yeah, and they, um, I remember them because my friends were kind of annoyed because, you know, who are these people coming in? Um, what are Asians doing playing basketball? You know, and, and, and <laughs> things like that. And what languages are they speaking? It's not Japanese, it's not Korean, it's not Chinese, it's no Asian I know about. And then my father sat me down, and my father and I have a rough relationship, but one of the nicest things he said to me, or one of the best things he said is, don't judge, you don't know their story. Yeah. And so um, I did judge, because I was, in, I was growing up at the time, and I've become very remorseful about that, because these are people who have overcome a lot, as most, um, most people who come to this country do. And so when I was writing about this, this was also um, my way of trying to show that because um, it really sucks to hate or to, yeah, literally, or wonder or have animosity towards a group and then later on have to eat crow and say, oh, I really was racist. And yes, Asians can be racist too. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, I think it was a wonderful. I think you totally achieved that. Yeah. I think you told a, a, a story. You yeah. did what science fiction can do. You you took this uh, real story that uh, would be good for people to know, and you put it in such an interesting, uh, uh, different light, and let us see it uh, from you know from some uncommon stars. Thank huh. you very much. Yeah, I and just um, wanted to say too. You know, just the world is not a perfect place, and so we all. I wanted in this world. I wanted in my book to show that you know you can screw up. And it's never going to be perfect, but it never was. And you have choices every day to, to do what you need to do. And if you, can, you know, if you can choose for a better life for you or your community, go for it. And donuts are really good, too. Right. Which actually is a perfect segue into another question we had. Uh, one of the things that really stuck with both of us about the novel is um, the constant descriptions, just like excellent descriptions of the food. Mm -hmm. the different food everyone eats. And um, it's really one of the, the ground, we feel the grounding influences of the novel that brings the reader in. Like we can all share that experience because we know 
what you're describing. Um, we think you did a wonderful job Thank with you it. Very was that much. was that intentional? Um, was that just something that ended up happening? Like, at, why is why is food play such a prominent role in your novel? Well, I don't. Why do guns play such a prominent role in so many American lives? It's part of our life. When I was writing about food, and this is the first time I've given this answer. I wasn't thinking about writing about food. I was thinking about writing about my world. And my world is in the kitchen, and there's food, and we're, we're talking about things, and we're slicing and cutting and getting the best ingredients. And um, I really love that people think it's something that is striking, because that shows why it's so important to have different authors with different viewpoints in our science fiction community. We're all writing about things that are somewhat, you know, if we write about things that are familiar to us, and we all come from the same place, it's all going to be familiar. But when we bring in more diverse authors, what's familiar to us is, might be a little different to you. And then you can catch some wonder in, in it. And, and, you know, and that would be great because science fiction's given me a lot of wonder. Yeah, I think it, it's a, what, to me it was a nice blend of, of wonder, the food descriptions I mean, specifically, um, wonder and like I said, grounding. Like it was like, oh. okay, this is something you, I can taste. You ain't a good cook unless you can ground your your family and bring them to the table and have right. them eat. <laughs> um, which also uh, brings me to another question um, about the novel. Uh, uh -huh. It's maybe the first novel I've read that was as explicitly literary fiction. Your writing is beautiful. Thank your you. characters are beautiful. Um, it really brought us into the world and. Um, made us experience new empathy for new people, which is, uh, you know, it's rare, it's hard to pull off, and it's also, I think, the, the goal of writing. Um, you achieved it in our eyes. Um, and, uh, but I've also, I've never seen that blended with science fiction and fantasy at the same time. And as we were, you know, progressing through the novel, it feels like you're wondering how the fantasy's working and you're wondering how the science fiction's working and whether it's a metaphor, whether it's real, and then um, just loved that it's kind of like everyone in the world's like, oh yeah, spaceships, aliens, demons, like the like all the all the normal people in the book, you know, the the regular the people who aren't involved in the story as mm -hmm. much, just like the passers by, are just kind of like, Yeah, I mean she's got a demon. Like it's very casual. Mm -hmm. Um can you talk about that a little bit? I think that um, one of the things, I think there are a lot of things in fantasy that are kind of wishful thinking. And one of the big ones for me that, you know, basically that fastball down the middle that I was hoping to get past my reader was that you could recognize your own weirdness and recognize other people can be weird too. That's the big one. You know, we're, and are you normal? No, not. None of us really. I mean, no, no. And so if we can recognize that we all hold a little bit of queerness, a little bit of weirdness, a little bit of outsiderness, then whatever we bring in, it just adds to the potluck, I think. And just um, so the other thing, too, is um, when I am uh, as a queer person, as a person of color, as a professor, as a writer, I operate in different modes. I don't think I'm that different from other people, but it might be that my modes are a little different, you know, what I do. Right. But I hope that also lets readers understand their own worlds and the diversity in their worlds, where they use magic, where they use science, and what a beautiful person they are and what a wonderful creature they are for holding it all together. Yeah. And I, I guess to clarify, when I say, like, the normal characters, I mean, like, the mundane characters, like the yeah. characters who aren't uh, part of the fantasy or science fiction part of the story. Absolutely. And that's the thing. They they just, they kind of all recognize none of us are quite normal. And, yeah. and there's a normality. If we can normalize not being normal, not bad. Yeah, that's great. And, and the... Um, and so you chose specifically to put in the science fiction and the fantasy uh, elements, or did that mm. just kind of naturally arise? Well, I knew that I had to balance things out. I'm going to get a, just a, a little crafty. Let's go. Um, so I'm dealing, there's somebody there who's just, you know, a straight up demon. And I didn't want to go the Constantine route. I didn't want to write an entire book about salvation and heaven and hell. So I wanted to kind of have that as one character, but I also needed a way to balance that kind of power. 
So I brought the aliens kind of came in. I said, okay, this works because neither of them really know what the other one is doing. And yet they kind of cancel each other out. How that works, I can, I can see a storm happening. And now we can work with this in terms of plot. And so I, I really wanted, when I work on books, I kind of want to make sure that everything's balanced. And then from there, we don't know, but we'll figure it out. Yeah, it, it, it does feel very balanced. And it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's cool because, like, like I said, um, it achieves the goal of the literary fiction aspect. I think that the characters are so, um, they're so easy to empathize with and really bring us into the world and the story. The setting does as well. Um, but also the genre elements are, you've explored something new with the genre elements and made a new combo that, that um, makes it interesting from a genre pr uh, fiction perspective as well, mm -hmm. like, through your exploration. I, I'd like to take credit for a lot of that, but there have been queer and uh, trans and people of color who've been fans of science fiction since there has been science fiction. and what the, the, the gymnastics that have been done to adopt the tropes to our communities and who we are, uh, not just me, but I see so many other writers right now bringing those to the greater community, and it's been great. So um, this is one place where I'm just gonna have to thank the community and the ancestors because, um, you know, I, I feel very uh, fortunate to, um, to be Asian, to be everything that I am, there have been times where it's gotten in my way, but ultimately I do feel fortunate and I do want to share. And being able to write about people around me and take everyone to the stars and bring you all along lets me share. Isn't that cool? It is cool. And we're really thankful that you shared with us. It I, meant a lot to us. You know, this is the whole thing. I think, you know, a lot of times what we would might call the old science fiction guard and things like that might think that writers from that are coming in who might not look like them are somehow trying to take down. No, this is all respect. This is all thank you very, very much for the beautiful books you gave. And now we get to play too. And we hope we can give you dreams and wonders and stars. We hope you make, you know, we just hope you read the book and have a great weekend because that's what you did for us so many times. Well, um, what is your next work? We hear that you might be working on a little bit more of the galactic end of this I'm working novel. on, so. The next novel that I'm working on right now, I see this, there's going to be two more books at least in this series. So the next one is going to be a spinoff of two of the characters from Light from Uncommon Stars kind of become the main character and main catalyst in the next book. There's going to be angels in it. There's going to be, uh, there is cyber fiction. So I'm going the cyber route a little bit, you know, information war and things like that. And um, that is, and, and Japanese gods and... Uh, and a cast iron skillet. Uh, one of the main characters is going to be a cast iron skillet. Yes, I know, but I'm going to do it. And they're going to fry dumplings and you're going to like them. Uh, so, so that's what I'm up to there. And then later, what I was hoping Tor lets me do, and by the way, Tor, you rock, uh, is that uh, to, you know how uh, at the end, I don't want to spoil, but they go off into space and they play? There's going to be people who want to come taste the donuts and have the breadsticks. And how do they do that when their world is destroyed? How do they pick themselves up? And so I hope to end it in a good way. That's incredibly exciting. We I'm, can't wait to read it. Hey, and just, just so happy to make both of your acquaintances. Yeah, when can we uh, look out for that? Hopefully next book, late next year. Okay, awesome. Um, and then we have a couple more quick ones for you. Um, have you read any, what are some of the sci-fi books you've read in the last year that you just love? Uh, I've read... Well, the first one, the every in Maxwell's books, I'm just going to call them out because they're they're that sweet, and I don't know. I mean, I call it derpy. I call it derpy in the best, most lovable way because her characters are like so. Just tell each other you love each other. You know, just just love each other, and I, I just love the way that uh, Everina has been able to uh, blend a really well built world with galactic, you know, with, with romance. It, it's really, I've really been enjoying that. Um, the other one, um, Sarah Gailey's latest book, um, I, I forget the name, some, no place like Home. Forgive me if I get that wrong. I'm not a really big horror reader, but Sarah Gailey's book just made me go because the way she talks about horror, there's so much sensitivity and uh, 
to the human condition and just to, to feelings and sentiment that you kind of start to sense you kind of like start to have feelings for the horrible, ugly thing that's under the bed that's glistening. And you're just wondering, why am I feeling these feelings? I doubt, I doubt everything that I am. And that's what a good book should do. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that for so, sure. Everina Maxwell, Sarah Gailey, but also go read a book you've never heard of because you know what? That's how people got to me. And I'm so grateful. And I hope, you know, I hope it was worth it for those people who tried. All right, last one. You got it. Um, who are you going to call first if you win the Hugo this year? My agent. Yeah. No, 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 no. Actually, not my agent. My sister. Uh, so my sister is, uh, you know, right now she, um, with my family, I grew up in a very sort of traditional family. When I came out to my sister as being trans, she was super supportive. And... She's reading my book, she, and, and she's, she's the one who tells me, like, we'll go to a bookstore, I'll sign. She goes, do you know how amazing that is? And I'm kind of blanking out because this is just, I don't want to go there. I just want to be a, a good writer. But she's the one who holds a lot of the wonder. So if I win, I'm calling her. And then I'm calling my agent. Hi, Meredith, because, you know, agent. And I love her, and she's amazing. Awesome. Well... Rika Aoki, thank you so much for spending your thank time you. with us. Um, it was truly an honor to get to speak with you. Back at you. Thank you, everybody. And keep reading good books, y'all. And talk about them because we need you to talk about them. Yeah.